Uh, would you pray with me? Father, we do um, thank you once again for the opportunity to gather as your people uh, to take time out on this, the first day of the week before we enter the rush of our everyday life, just to uh, pause and to contemplate you, remind ourselves that we're your children, that you are our God, and that we are people who uh, are created to be in relationship with you and created for a purpose. Would you come once again by your Holy Spirit and commune with us today? Uh, Lord Jesus, would you walk among us, be with us today? Amen. So according to Wikipedia, Caligula accepted his powers as emperor in 37 AD and entered Rome amid a crowd that hailed him as our baby and our star, among other nicknames. Uh, Caligula is described as the first emperor who is admired by, quote, everyone in all the world from the rising to the setting sun. In AD 38, he focused his attention on political and public reform. He published the accounts of public funds, which had not been made public during the reign of his predecessor, Tiberius. He aided those who lost property in fires, abolished certain taxes, and gave out prizes to the public at gymnastic events. He allowed new members into the equestrian and senatorial orders. Perhaps most significantly, he restored the practice of democratic elections for some positions. He granted bonuses to the military. His predecessor as emperor, Tiberius, had been hated and feared by everyone because he had used trials for a supposed treason, trumped up trials, to kill anyone with whom he disagreed. Caligula declared that treason trials were a thing of the past and recalled those who had been sent into exile. He helped those who'd been harmed by the imperial tax system and put on lavish spectacles for the public, including gladiatorial games. The Jewish philosopher and writer Philo, who was a contemporary, uh, described the first seven months of Caligula's reign as completely blissful. According to Philo and other writers of the time, however, Caligula quickly grew self-absorbed and angry and began to kill on a whim. He had his cousin and adopted son, Tiberius Gemellus, executed. He most likely poisoned his grandmother, Antonia Minor. He executed his father-in-law and brother-in-law. It's recorded how once, at some games at which he was presiding, he ordered his guards to throw an entire section of the audience into the arena during the intermission to be eaten by the wild beasts because there were no prisoners to be used, and he was bored. He also began to spend lavishly and engage in unrestrained promiscuity. He reportedly turned the palace into a brothel, regularly slept with other men's wives, and then bragged about it. In AD 40, he began appearing in public dressed as various gods and demigods, such as Hercules, Mercury, Venus, and Apollo. Reportedly at that time, he also began referring to himself as a god and had the heads removed from various statues of gods around Rome and replaced them with his own. He tried to get a statue of himself erected in the temple in Jerusalem. Caligula's life perfectly exemplifies the truth stated by the British politician and writer Lord Acton over a hundred years ago, that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. Another king whose life exemplifies this truth is the Jewish king Saul. And today we begin a new series, this time from the Old Testament, in which we look at lessons to be learned from the life 
of King David. But we'll begin by looking at the life of Saul. And particularly, we'll be focusing on why he failed as a king. Now, if you remember your history, the Israelites were led out of slavery in Egypt by Moses. And after Moses died, his assistant, Joshua, took over. After Joshua's death, Israel continued uh, to exist as a coalition of 12 different tribes, right? We're talking about the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And for the next 200 years or so, Israel was led by a succession of 12 different leaders referred to as judges. Now, although we generally think of a judge as someone who hears and tries a case, uh, these judges were essentially leaders who were primarily military leaders who delivered Israel from a succession of enemy nations who invaded and attacked them. Now, during the period of the judges, the Israelites would fall away from Yahweh. They would uh, ignore his law. They would begin to oppress the poor, <coughs> worship other gods. Uh, their judges uh, would, would begin to take bribes, not their, sorry, not confusion. <laughs> they, the, uh, those hearing cases would begin to corrupt justice. Right? And then uh, an enemy people would attack invade their land, oppress them over a period of time, they would begin to cry out to God, to Yahweh, and eventually he would raise up another judge who would lead them into victory against the, their oppressors and would free them. But then eventually they would begin again to neglect Yahweh's commands and the whole cycle would repeat. Now, what's important to note, however, is that during this time, as I said, the tribes of Israel were a, a loose coalition of tribes. Okay? There was no king. There was no centralized governing authority. Why didn't they have a king? Well, because God was their king. Yahweh was to be their king. I'm sorry. I don't know. Do I need to move this down? It seems like it's popping a lot. Where should I put it? Back pocket, back pocket. Back pocket. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll try to remember that. Sorry about that. Okay. So, the Israelites, right, for 200 years were a coalition of tribes with no centralized authority, no king, because it was understood that Yahweh was to be their king, not a man. Okay? So, we, we will be looking at 1 Samuel today, and we're going to begin in chapter 8. When we pick up our story, the prophet Samuel is the, is the judge who is leading Israel at this time. Okay? Acting as Yahweh's mouthpiece. Um, verses 4 to 5 record that all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. And the Israelites believe that their inability to gain a lasting victory over their enemies is owing to the fact that they don't have a king. As Old Testament scholar John Walton puts it, the leaders of Israel have decided that they want a permanent head of government empowered with centralized authority over the tribes and commanding a standing army. They've concluded that their organization as a federation of tribes has put them at a military disadvantage. They believe that their problem is a political one and to opt for a political solution. They don't recognize that their fundamental problem is an inability to remain faithful to God's covenant. 
It's their breaking of this repeatedly that leads to continual defeat at the hands of enemies, not the fact that they don't have an earthly king. Samuel, as you might expect, uh, is displeased by this request. Verses 6 to 8 tell us that when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel, so he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are, uh, so they are doing to you. Right? So up to this point, as I mentioned, there had been no king. God was the one who raised up the judges as military leaders, but it was always seen as God working through the judges God, who brought the victory. God was their king. In seeking a human king, they are in essence rejecting God. So God, through Samuel the prophet, warns the Israelites about the consequences of their asking for a human king to rule over them. In verses 9 to 18, God tells Samuel, Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage, your male and female servants, and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. This is really a pretty amazing passage. Why? Well, because the idea of kingship was firmly entrenched in all of the surrounding countries at this time in the ancient Near East. The king was seen as God's divine representative on earth and responsible for maintaining the cosmic balance. In Egypt, the king actually was a god. And yet this passage clearly lays out an argument against kings arguing that they're dangerous because invariably they're corrupted by power and begin to exploit the very people they are to serve. Now, as you might expect, the Israelites disregard this warning and they demand a king. So God, again, through Samuel, says, okay, I'll get you a king. Chapter 9, in chapter 9 then, the scene shifts to Saul a young man from the tribe of Benjamin who is sent by his father to look for his donkeys that have been lost. In the process, he meets Samuel, the prophet. God tells Samuel that Saul is the one that he's selected as king. Now, Saul's first reaction at being told by Samuel that he is to be king is one of disbelief. Am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel and is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? Okay, so he's, he's astounded that he could be considered king. <laughs> Samuel anoints Saul and then tells him to await further instructions. He then gathers all of the Israelites at Mizpah, a town in the territory of Benjamin, and there he presents Saul to them. Now, when he first calls for Saul, nobody can find him. Why? Well, because he's actually hiding out among the baggage animals. Samuel sends some people to bring Saul. They run and they get him. And when the people see him, they bring Saul back. And when the people see him, they see that he is a head taller than anyone else. And shout, long live the king! They respond enthusiastically to Saul, but they're judging by outward appearances only. Okay? They're not judging from a spiritual perspective. They don't know anything about him. They're merely seeing that he is taller than anyone else. 
Now, not long after Saul was crowned king, the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with a force far superior to that of the Israelites. They have thousands of chariots and soldiers as numerous as the sands of the sea, seashore. Samuel tells Saul to go to a place called Gilgal and wait until he comes and as prophet performs burnt offerings to the Lord to ensure success in the upcoming battle. Okay, so Saul is told, go wait at Gilgal, wait for me and I'm gonna come, don't fight, don't do anything until I, as the Lord's prophet, come and present burnt offerings to the Lord to ensure success in the upcoming battle against the Philistines. Okay? Now, verses 5 to 11, this is 13, 5 to 11, tell us that Saul remained at Gilgal and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. As king, Saul's primary duty before anything else was to obey God's commands spoken through Samuel and other prophets. Here at the very beginning of his reign, at a critical juncture, he disobeys rather than trusts. He acts rashly and impulsively. He also does something that historically has always proven dangerous. He combines both the kingly and the prophetic roles. And why is this dangerous? Because historically, the prophets acted as a <laughs> counterbalance to the power of the kings. By acting in Samuel's place, Saul is consolidating both positions. So how does Samuel respond? He's furious. 13, verses 13 to 14, in, in those verses, Samuel rep replies, you've done a foolish thing. You've not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Okay. So he prophesies Saul's replacement eventually by David. Then in chapter 14, right, uh, verses 1 to 24 tell how through Jonathan, the son of Saul and his armor bearer, uh, through their attacking the Philistines, and because of a panic sent by God, the Philistines are routed. But once again, this time at the moment of triumph, Saul acts in a rash and impulsive way. Verse 24 tells us that the Israelites were in distress that day because Saul had bound the people under an oath saying, Cursed be anyone who eats food before evening comes, before I have avenged myself on my enemies, so none of the troops tasted food. Jonathan, without knowing his father's oath, comes upon some wild honey and dipping his staff in it, eats some. Saul, upon hearing this, seeks to kill Jonathan, but is prevented from doing so by his troops. The passage tells us that the Israelites actually would have wound up uh, killing far more Philistines and being far more successful had they been able to eat. But because they became faint with hunger over the course of the day, they weren't able to continue pursuing the Philistines. Right? This incident further reveals, it reveals once again, Saul's rashness and impetuosity. It's almost as though because he's king, he feels that he can do whatever he wants, or he doesn't really have to, feels as though he doesn't actually have to think through the consequences of his actions. Then a little later, Saul is sent by God to war against a nearby people, the Amalekites, 
in Scripture, they're described as an evil people who practice human sacrifice, who during the Israelites' march through the desert when they were leaving Egypt, uh, had attacked them without provocation, falling, falling upon the sick, aged, and tired who were lagging behind the main body of Israelites. The Amalekites then continued to attack Israel on and off over the next couple hundreds of years. God had finally has had enough, and he tells Saul in 15.3, go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. This is one of those passages from the Old Testament that rightfully gives us quite a bit of anguish. Right? We're rightfully disturbed at the thought of God commanding Jews to commit genocide. I'm not even going to attempt at this time to address this issue. All right? um, the main point for us today is that God gives Saul a clear command. Okay? And what does Saul do? Verses 7 to 9 tell us that Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. So Saul, again, disobeys a clear command from God, and keeping the healthy livestock for himself kills only the sick and weak, and he lets the king of the Amalekites live. Okay? Verses 13 to 21 record how when Samuel comes and finds what Saul has done, he begins to chastise the king for once again disobeying God. Far from being contrite, however, Saul actually begins to argue with Samuel. Now, folks, it is never a good idea to argue with the prophet of the Lord. Generally does not end well. Okay? Saul, Saul ends the, uh, the argument by saying, uh, I'm sorry, yes, the soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord at Gilgal. Okay, so he's, he's arguing with Samuel. Samuel, I'm sorry, Samuel's response, and this is when he brings the conversation to an end, is very important, and it's found in verses 22 to 23. Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying? the Lord. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. So the passage tells us that God has rejected Saul as king. More importantly, however, it indicates why God has rejected him. It outlines from God's perspective why Saul has failed as king. He failed first and foremost because he was disobedient and rebellious. He, quote, rejected the word of the Lord, meaning he rejected and disobeyed a direct command from God through his prophet Samuel. Right? Instead, Saul did what he wanted to do, rather than what God was telling him to do. Samuel's warning to the Israelites very quickly came to pass. They put their hope in a man rather than God, and once having entrusted Saul with power, he almost immediately began to be corrupted by it. Before he was made king, if you remember, Saul had a, a corrective view of himself, right? He, he was aware of his own unimportance vis-a-vis -vis God. He was shocked when he was told he would be made king. And when he was to be presented to the Israelites, he was actually hiding out. After he was made king, however, he begins to feel that he can do whatever he wants. 
he forgets that his authority ultimately comes from God. It keeps getting worse and worse until later in his reign, as we will see, out of jealousy, he attempts to kill David. And even worse, or as bad, he kills, ends up killing the priests of Yahweh. So Saul became arrogant and believed as king he didn't have to obey God. He could do what he wanted. He forgot the truth found in Isaiah 57, 15. This is what, 50, this is what Isaiah says. For this is what the high and exalted one says. This is God speaking. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. And what you see throughout Scripture, throughout the Old and the New Testaments, is that pride generally lies at the root of all sin. The belief that we are our own gods, we can choose to decide for ourselves between good and evil. We don't have to, to listen to God at all, that there's no higher power above ourselves. And so we go our own ways. Conversely, what is shown in, throughout Scripture is that God draws near to those who are humble, who are broken by their sins, by their shortcomings, who are aware of their need for God. Right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus says. Why? Because they understand their need for a God. Scripture reminds us that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, another of the lessons that we learn from this passage is that you should never concentrate power in the hands of one person, because power corrupts. More fundama fundamentally, however, the problem is that the Israelites <laughs> forgot that God was ultimately their king. He was their only savior. And he was the one who was to deliver them from their problems. They needed to put their ultimate hope in God, but they put it in a person. So what can a story like this have to say to people like us today? <coughs> living in the 21st century in a modern representative democracy. Well, I think that just like the Israelites, today we still have the tendency to look to human leaders as the answer to our problems, to put our hope in a man or a woman. This is generally never a good idea. Why? Well, because of human nature. Christianity has traditionally held a tension. It is believed that mankind, on one hand, is created, men and women are created in the image of God, and therefore they are of immeasurable worth. In the West, this led to the idea of human rights. At the same time, however, Christianity has seen human nature as fallen, fundamentally flawed, and prone to evil. Therefore, it's also, at the same time, maintained a suspicion of his country, who were functioning under a broadly Judeo-Christian worldview, created a government of checks and balances to prevent any one person from getting too much power. If you don't believe in a biblical worldview, however, and increasingly people do not, you trust in human nature. You don't worry about human nature. And so you look to a person to solve your problems. And you're not worried about giving that person more and more power. The Israelites under Samuel thought their problem was fundamentally political, when in fact it was spiritual. Folks, we are in the same position. We keep thinking that if we could just get the right person into the White House, if our side, whichever side that is, could just gain the reins of power, then we'd be able to work everything out. Folks, our problems are much greater than that. Amen. And the problems of our country are fundamentally spiritual problems. But like the Israelites, we keep looking for, for political answers. 
we increasingly look to government as the solution for all of our problems. Right? Because if you don't believe in God, and again, increasingly, if the surveys are true, we don't as a culture, then government is the closest thing to an all-powerful entity. As belief in God has declined, right, politics has come more and more to take the place that religious faith once held. Politics is seen as offering the only answer to the problems of our country, because whoever controls government, the highest power, controls the ability, therefore, to solve our problems. And what this means, then, is that if you don't vote my way, then you're not someone with whom I can agree to disagree. You're evil. You know what I'm talking about. This, I mean, this is where we're at. Because if you vote for so-and-so, you're going to destroy our country. Okay? So, what are some of the ways that perhaps we could, you know, let's talk about next steps, right? What are, what are perhaps some ways that we might, as the people of God, respond maybe to a situation that, that, that is crying out for an alternative or crying out for people who are not quick to line up, you know, between behind one of the prevailing sides, if you will. Well, I think one thing we can do is stop looking for Washington to solve all of our problems. There's not a lot that we can do to affect things nationally. But there is a fair amount that we can do to affect things locally. And so I would just say, right, you've heard the, the phrase, all politics are local, right? And I would just say what we can do if we're really looking to make a difference, if we are, if you are bothered by what is going on in this country, one thing you can do is seek to make a difference in your local community. Don't wait for Washington to do something. Consider running for a local office or a board position, right? City council, school board. Get involved in helping a local nonprofit that's seeking to address a problem like homelessness. I would say more fundamentally, or before all of that, we need to be praying for the other side whatever that is for you, right? Do you pray for the current president? Did you pray for the last president? Scripture tells us to pray for those who are in authority. Right? Are we praying for Nancy Pelosi? Are we praying for Trump? Again, take your pick. Right? But we're called to be a people of peace who have one Lord, Jesus. It doesn't mean that we don't, we're not ever involved in politics or that we're never, you know, but it's that ultimately and fundamentally our allegiance is to Jesus. And what we do is when we put our hope, and just be honest, so evangelicals. <coughs> using that term broadly, in the United States, for the last 40 years, have sought to bring about the kingdom of God in part through political means. And I'm an evangelical, so I'm not, I'm not, okay? So we've forgotten that the kingdom of God does not primarily come through getting the right people in office and enacting laws. <laughs> And unfortunately, we have become so associated, I'll just say, I, I think that we've become so associated with a group that is tied to a particular political party that, is, you attempted, that has attempted to use political means that I think that at some point there's going to be a backlash. And we'd be, instead of being known as people who, uh, whose fundamental and primary allegiance is to Jesus, 
the people who seek to love their enemies and pray for them. Nothing wrong with disagreeing. I think we should, right? I mean, I'm not talking about being mealy mouthed and just kind of compromising. And but there's a way to seek the truth while proclaiming love and praying for our enemies. And, and there's a way to seek to bring about change by voting for candidates you believe in, while at the same time preaching the gospel and working for the peace of God in whatever city we're in. Right? And, and so I believe that, that one word that God has for us from this passage is, that, is to remind us of whom our trust is in, right? And how genuine change is going to come about. And to remind us that we're to be people of peace, right? Whichever side you're on, we're to pray for those with whom we disagree. And, and, and above all else, we're to uphold the name of Jesus as the hope of the world. Jesus is the hope of the world. It starts there. Okay? I would also say that, you know, I mentioned that our problems, I believe, are primarily spiritual. Right? And I think something else that we can do is that we are the people who have made consumerism, buying stuff, we've made politics, we've made success, we've made wealth our gods, and we've run after them. We live in a culture where notoriety, right, somebody is famous now, not because you've done anything worthy of, of a claim, but because you made a sex tape and posted it online. Do you realize how corrupt we've become as a culture? Open your eyes. Look around, folks. And some of those who are older, those of us who, who are getting up there in years, know just how quickly things have changed. And so I think one of the things that we can do as a people, first and foremost, is to take a hard look at ourselves, right? One of the problems that the Israelites had was that they continually ran after other gods. What are the gods in our lives that we continually run after? Have we bought into the lie? Have we just adopted the gods of our culture? What are we running after? Are we running after success? Are we running after pleasure? Are we running after constant entertainment? Right? So I would say the first thing that we can do in our private times this week is to take a look at our own hearts and say, Lord, where, where, who has my heart? Right? Lord, is, are my affections set upon you before anything else? It's a wonderful, wonderful time to be alive. It's a frightening time. But if you, you know, you think of the story of Esther in the Old Testament, right? What if God has intended for all of us to live in just such a time as this because there's an important work for you to do. There's an important work for us to do as God's people. And the good news is that God is faithful. Amen. Okay, I'll stop before I go to another sermon. <laughs> <laughs>